Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're watching this service. But this service is for our January 2nd uh, service. And so we say to you, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to each one, and may God's blessing be upon you and be upon us as we move forward as a church family. There will be uh, announcements that will come out through email. Uh, Kathy constantly writes emails to make sure you're informed or kept informed the best we can, and uh, you will find out as we progress through this next phase of the variant and uh, uh, see what steps we need to take as a church family. So, Happy New Year. God bless you. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, embrace us, that you would give to each one of us hope, love, and peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to watch a video about New Year's. Hello everyone, glad to see you here for worship today. Let's get started with a call to worship from Psalm 89. This is Psalm 89, verse 1 through 5. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Let's worship. Mm -hmm. of mercy never cease call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise a mountain fixed upon mount of thy Safely to arrive at home. 
Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious love. Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fair Find my wandering heart to be Prone to wander, Lord, I feel Prone to leave the God I love He is my heart Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts of love. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are prone to wander. We're prone to seek out our own good. We're prone to find comfort anywhere but in you. We're prone to work for a salvation that's freely given. So we ask that you would forgive us of the times we turn from you and constantly remind us that we can do nothing to earn your grace because it was bought for us on the cross. Amen. Now let's read Matthew 11. 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. thy faithfulness O God my Father there is no shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been now forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see.
my vision, O Lord of my heart. None be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by Sleeping thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee, thou. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou Now and always Thou and Thou only Be first in my heart I, King of Heaven My treasure Thou art of heaven after victory won may I reach heaven's joys O heaven's son heart of my own heart whatever befall still be my Lord, we ask that this worship today would help to turn our minds from the worries and pursuits of this world and onto you and your perfect kingdom. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to start a series uh, called Attitudes That Shape the Heart, and we're going to be looking at things that, that will affect our lives on a daily basis, and we're going to be looking at uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, if you have your Bibles at home, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Friends, what would it take to make you happy? Now, the interesting thing is that most people try to find happiness through external means instead of internal means. And the popular idea of happiness today is having all the right circumstances. Now, the classic chapter for the search of happiness is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're not going to look at that today, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, Solomon says this, I tried to enjoy myself and find out what happiness is. See, here Solomon says, I've tried it all. I found three dead ends, three real dead ends to happiness. They are when we accumulate things, it does not produce happiness. When we experience pleasures, it does not produce happiness. And when we achieve success, it does not produce happiness. 
The problem in all three of those things are that most people spend their lives, their entire lives, trying to get it. But Solomon says, hey, folks, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. Ecclesiastes 2 and 17 says this, all of it is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Now, my dad taught me a long time ago, trying to catch a chicken was a tough thing. Because just when I thought I would catch it, it would scoot away. And what Solomon is saying to us here in Ecclesiastes 2 is that it's all meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, we can read the opening lines of Jesus' famous sermon on the mount. There we find eight positive statements about happiness, which they simply call the Beatitudes. Eight attitudes that will shape your heart. Eight ways for us to be happy. Now, why did Jesus think this was so important? Because he knew it was something that everyone was searching for and very few people found. Now, each of those Beatitudes begin with the word blessed. And the word blessed is an old English word that simply means happy. And Jesus is saying, happy are you. I'm going to read for you uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, and I'm going to substitute out the word happy, uh, or put the word happy in for the word blessed. Here we go. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Happy are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we read those verses, it sounds uh, like a contradiction. Happy if you are sad. Happy if you are poor. Happy if you're being put down and persecuted. Now, that doesn't sound like happiness to me. But the point that Jesus is trying to get across is simply this. You and I can be happy despite our circumstances. That we can be happy despite all the things that are going on in our lives. Jesus is saying that our happiness doesn't depend on the right circumstances. It depends on the right attitude. In other words, happiness is a choice. So today we're going to look at that very first attitude, Matthew 5 and 3, which says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does he, Jesus, mean when he says poor in spirit? He's not talking about putting yourself down all the time. You know, I'm no good, I'm junk. Friends, Jesus didn't die for junk. You have value, you have worth, you have significance. So what does he mean by poor in spirit? He simply means depend on God. Admitting that I don't have it all together and that I'm not perfect and that I, you and me, need God. The Living Bible says this, happy are the humble. If you want to have a lasting happiness in your life, then you need to learn to be humble. Now maybe you're saying, Les, how can humility increase my happiness? Well, let me give you three things this morning to uh, add to your uh, knowledge uh, and to your heart as we uh, work our way through it. Number one, the first thing is this, 
humility reduces stress in my life. In other words, when I am humble, I don't have all the answers to life's questions. I realize that the world isn't depending on me. Friends, I remember when I had to uh, resign as the manager of the world and let God do what he does. You see, when I'm humble, I realize I don't have to solve everything. When I'm humble, I don't have to pretend that I'm perfect because God's not demanding that I be perfect in order to be happy. And humility accepts the fact that you can be happy even though things aren't ideal because you're depending on God and not on your circumstances. The second thing I would love you to write down is simply this. Humility improves your relationships. Humility improves your relationships. How many of you love to be around people with big heads? Friends, selfish, self-centered people are an irritation. This kind of person wrecks relationships. Do you know why they wreck relationships? Because self-centered people are never happy. And they always make everyone else unhappy. They just spread all their doom and gloom. Now, on the other hand, how many of you enjoy being around humble people? People who aren't always trying to impress you. People who always aren't trying to tell a story uh, that is better than the story you just told them. You see, humility reduces stress in our lives and it improves our, relation, our relationships with other people. The third thing I want you to write down is this. Humility releases God's power in your life. This is really, really important. Let me just say it again. Humility releases God's power in your life and mine. James 4 and 6 in the Living Bible says this, God gives strength to the humble, but sets himself against the proud and the haughty. Notice the word strength. Friends, wouldn't you love to continue to have God's strength in your life? The Bible says that the secret to spiritual power is to walk humbly before the Lord and to realize that you need to depend on him. You're not in charge. I'm not in charge. God is. Matthew 5 and 3 says, Happy are those who know their need for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are those who need, know their need for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Notice the promise. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. What does that mean? It means all that God has to offer is available to the person who walks humbly before the Lord. The fact is, friends, every one of us needs Jesus Christ in our lives. Every one of us needs God's power in our lives to make it through the next week. His power is available and he's waiting to pour it out into your life and mine. But we need to ask. We need to ask. We need to admit that we need his help in our lives. John 13 and 17 says this. Now that you know the truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. How happy you will be if you put it into practice. Wow. I want to ask you a question this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, depending on when you're watching this uh, video. Where do you need to practice humility this next week? Where in your life, with whom do you need to practice a sense of humility? Friends, life is not a contest to see who can outdo the other one. 
Remember, the way to tap into God's power in your life only comes when you humble yourself before him. When we say, Lord, please help, and we humble ourselves before him, then God says to us, the kingdom of heaven will be theirs. It'll be yours. It'll be mine. It's an attitude of humility which will shape your heart in this coming year. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can give to each one of us humility, that we would depend on you, not trying to depend on our circumstances or on us. Use us this week. Help us to walk humbly before you and before others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.